Hey there, Miss Monist again. I'm here with chapter 13, Unfortunate Conclusions. This chapter is not too long, so I'm going to read the whole thing all at once. With his mouth shut tight and his feet moving as fast as thoughts could make them, Milo ran all the way back to the car. There was a great excitement when he arrived as talk raced happily down the road to greet him. The humbug personally accepted all congratulations from the crowd. Where's the sound? Someone hastily scribbled on the blackboard and they all waited anxiously for the reply. Remember, he caught a word in his mouth before it came out. Milo caught his breath, picked up the chalk and explained simply, it's on the tip of my tongue. Several people excitedly threw their hats into the air. Some shouted what would have been a loud hurrah and the rest pushed the heavy cannon into place. They aimed it directly at the thickest part of the fortress wall and packed it full of gunpowder. Milo stood on tiptoe, leaned over into the cannon's mouth and parted his lips. There he is. What do you think, is it gonna work? Will it, dis will it uh, knock down the fortress? The small sound dropped silently to the bottom and everything was ready. In another moment, the fuse was lit and sputtering. I hope no one gets hurt, thought Milo, and before he had time to think again, an immense cloud of gray and white, white smoke leapt from the, from the gun, and along with it, so softly that it was hardly heard, came the sound of, but. It flew toward the wall for several seconds in a high, lazy arc, and then struck ever so lightly just to the right of the big door. For an instant, there was an ominous stillness, quieter and more silent than ever before, as if even the air was holding its breath. And then, almost immediately, there was a blasting, roaring, thundering smash, followed by a crushing, shattering, bursting crash, as every stone in the fortress came toppling to the ground and the vaults burst open, spilling the sounds of history into the wind. Every sound that had been uttered or made from way back to when there was none to way up to when there were too many came hurtling out of the debris in a way that sounded as though everyone in the world was laughing, whistling, shouting, crying, singing, whispering, humming, screaming, coughing, and sneezing all at the same time. There were bits of old speeches floating about as well as recited lessons, gunshots from old wars, babies crying, auto horns, waterfalls, electric fans, galloping horses, and a great deal of everything else. For a while, there was a total and deafening confusion. And then, almost as quickly as they'd come, all the old sounds disappeared over the hill in search of their new freedom, and things were normal again. The people quickly went about their busy, talkative business, and as the smoke and dust cleared, only Milo, Talk, and the Humbug noticed the sound keeper sitting disconsolately on a pile of rubble. I'm terribly sorry, said Milo sympathetically as the three of them went to console her, but we had to do it, added Talk. What a terrible mess, observed the humbug with his gnat for saying exactly the wrong thing. The soundkeeper looked around with an expression of unrelieved sadness on her unhappy face. It will take years to collect all those sounds again, she sobbed, and even longer to put them back in proper order, but it's all my fault for you can't improve sound by having only silence. The problem is to use each sound at the proper time. Here's a picture of all the sound coming out. As she spoke, the familiar and unmistakable squish squanch, squish squanch of the dine's heavy footsteps could be heard plodding over the hill. Remember that's the bluish smog creature. And when he finally appeared, he was dragging an incredibly large sack behind him. Can anyone use these sounds? He puffed, mopping his forehead. They all came over the hill at once, and none of them are awful enough for me. The soundkeeper peered into the sack, and there were all the sounds which had burst from the vaults. How nice of you to return them to me, she cried happily. You and the doctor must come by for an evening of beautiful music when my fortress is repaired. The thought of it so horrified the dine that, dine that he excused himself immediately and dashed off down the road in a great panic. I hope I haven't offended him, she said with some concern. He only likes unpleasant sounds, volunteered talk. Oh yes, she sighed. I keep forgetting that many people do, but I suppose they are necessary for you never really know how unpleasant one, you never really know how unpleasant one was unless you knew how unpleasant it wasn't. 
She paused for a moment, then continued. If only rhyme and reason were here, I'm sure things would improve. That's why we're going to rescue them, said Milo proudly. What a long and hard journey that will be. You'll need some nourishment, she cried, handing Milo a small brown package, neatly wrapped and tied with a string. Now remember, they're not for eating, but for listening, because you'll often be hungry for sounds as well as food. Here are street noises at night, train whistles a long way off, dry leaves burning, busy department stores, crunching toast, creaking bedspring, creaking bed springs, and of course, all kinds of laughter. There's a little of each, and in a far off, lonely place, I think you'll be glad to have them. I'm sure we will, replied Milo gratefully. Just take this road to the sea and then turn left, she told them. So you'll soon be at Digitopolis. And almost before she had finished, they had said goodbye and left the valley behind them. The shoreline was peaceful and flat, and the calm sea bumped it playfully along the sandy beach. In the distance, a beautiful island covered with palm trees and flowers beckoned invitingly from the sparkling water. Nothing can possibly go wrong now, cried the humbug happily. And as soon as he said it, he leapt from the car as if struck by a pen and sailed all the way to the little island. And we'll have plenty of time, answered Talk, who hadn't noticed that the bug was missing. And then he too suddenly leapt into the air and disappeared. It certainly couldn't be a nicer day, agreed Milo. There's a picture of the humbug being kind of like flown from the car. It certainly wouldn't, couldn't be a nicer day, agreed Milo, who was too busy looking at the road to see that the others had gone. And in a split second, he was gone also. He landed next to Talk and the terrified humbug on the tiny island, which now looked completely different. Instead of palms and flowers, there were rocks and twisted stumps of long dead trees. It certainly didn't seem like the same place they had seen from the road. Pardon me, said Milo to the first man who happened by. Can you tell me where I am? Pardon me, replied the man. Can you tell me who I am? The man was dressed in a shaggy tweed jacket and knickers with long woolen stockings and a cap that had a peak both in the front and the back, and he seemed confused as to who he could be. You must know who you are, said Milo impatiently. You must know where you are, he replied with equal annoyance. Oh dear, this is going to be difficult, Milo whispered to talk. I wonder if we can help him. They conferred for a few minutes and finally the bug looked up and said, can you describe yourself? Yes, indeed, the man replied happily. I'm as tall as I can be, until he grew straight up again, and so that all could be seen of him were his shoes and his stockings. And I'm as short as can be, and he shrank down to the size of a pebble. I'm as generous as can be, he said, handing each of them a large red apple. And I'm as selfish as can be, he snarled, grabbing them back. I'm as strong as can be, he roared, lifting an enormous boulder over his head. And I'm as weak as can be, he gasped, staggering underneath the weight of his hat. I'm as smart as he can as can be, he remarked in twelve different languages. And I'm as stupid as can be, he admitted, putting both feet in one shoe. I'm as graceful as can be, he hummed, balancing on one toe. And I'm as clumsy as can be, he cried, sticking his thumb in his eye. I'm as fast as can be, he announced, running around the island twice in no time at all. And I'm as slow as can be, he complained, waving goodbye to a snail. Is that any help to you? Once again, they conferred in busy whispers until they all three agreed. It's really very simple, said the humbug, twirling his cane. If everything you say is true, then without a doubt, Milo concluded brightly, you must be can be. There he is. That's where he's putting his feet into one shoe. Of course, yes, of course, the man shouted. Why didn't I think of that? I'm as happy as can be. Then he quack, quickly sat down and put his head in his hands and sighed, but I'm also as sad as can be. Now, will you please tell me where you are? Asked Talk as he looked around the desolate, desolate island. To be sure, said Canby. You're on the island of conclusions. Make yourself at home. You're apt to be here for some time. But how did we get here? asked Milo, who was still a bit puzzled by being there at all. You jumped, of course, exclaimed Canby. That's the way most everyone gets here. It's really quite simple. Every time you decide something without having a good reason, you jump to conclusions whether you like it or not. It's an easy trip to make. It's such an easy trip to make that I've been here hundreds of times. 
But this is such an unpleasant looking place, Milo remarked. Yes, that's true, admitted Canby. It does look much better from a distance. As he spoke, at least eight or nine more people sailed onto the island from every direction possible. Well, I'm going to jump right back, announced the humbug, who took two or three practice bends, leapt as far as he could, and landed in a heap two feet away. That won't do at all, scolded Canby, helping him to his feet. You can never, never jump away from conclusions. Getting back is not so easy. That's why we're so terribly crowded here. That was certainly the truth, for all along the bleak shore and clustered on the rocks, for as far as anyone could see, were enormous crowds of people, all sadly looking out to sea. Isn't there even a boat? asked Milo, anxious to get on with his trip. Oh no, replied Canby, shaking his head. The only way back is to swim, and that's a very long and very hard way. I don't like to get wet, moaned the unhappy bug, and he shuddered at the thought. Neither do they, neither do they, sorry, neither do they, said Canby sadly. That's what keeps them here. But I wouldn't worry too much about it, for you can swim all day in the sea of knowledge and still come out completely dry. And here's the people. Most people do, but you must excuse me now. I have to greet the new arrivals. As you know, I'm as friendly as can be. Over the humbug's strenuous objections, Milo and Talk decided to swim. And protesting loudly, the bug was dragged along with them toward the sea. Canby hurried off to answer more questions. And the last thing he heard, the last thing he was heard to say was, pardon me, can you tell me who I am? They swam and swam for what seemed like hours. And only Talk's firm encouragement kept Milo struggling through the icy water. At last, they reached the shore, thoroughly exhausted and except for the bug, completely soaked. That wasn't bad at all, the humbug said, straightening his tie and brushing himself off. I must visit there again. I'm sure you will, gasped Milo, but from now on, I'm going to have a very good reason before I make my mind up about anything. You can lose too much time jumping to conclusions. The car was just where they had left it, and in a moment they were on their way again as the road turned away from the sea and began its long climb into the mountains. The warm sun and billowy breezes dried them as they went. I hope we reach Digitopolis soon, said Milo, thinking of the breakfast they hadn't eaten. I wonder how far it is, far away it is. That's the end of chapter three. I wonder if they'll get to Digitopolis in chapter 14, which is called the Dodecatron Leads the Way. I think that's how you say that word. See you next time.